Well, good morning, everybody. I want to invite you to take your Bible and turn with me to the 17th chapter of the book of Acts. Acts chapter 17. And I want to say thanks to Pastor Rick for the opportunity to preach this summer. While he's been on sabbatical, we really look forward to welcoming him back next week. I want to say thanks to Carmen and the worship team. Don't they do a great job week after week? And I appreciate them this morning. Do you ever find that your TV doesn't work or some other appliance in your house doesn't work and it's because it wasn't plugged in? That's really embarrassing if you've already called the repair person to come out and service it. And they come and they say, well, is it plugged in? And they actually plug it in and then it works. It's just kind of an obvious illustration of the fact that sometimes life doesn't work and it's because we aren't plugged in. We're not plugged into God. We're not plugged into his word. We're not plugged into community with other people. Kind of an obvious illustration. We need the power of God flowing into our lives. We need to be plugged in. But then I realized when I looked at this little power strip, there's another point to that. The point of the Christian life is not just for you to be plugged in and me to be plugged in and receive power from God. What about this part? We are supposed to be plugged in so that other people can make a connection too. So that we provide a connecting place for other people to get plugged into God and into his word and into community with other people. Someone has said the church is the only organization on earth that exists primarily for the sake of those who aren't part of it yet. Think of it. The church isn't just about us. It's not just about you and it's not just about me. It's about people who don't yet know the Lord that we can help to connect to him. Some friends of mine are planting a new church in Auckland, New Zealand. And they sent me a picture of their logo. It's kind of an interesting thing. At the center of it is a cross to typify that they want to make Christ and the cross, the message of the cross, the very centerpiece of what they believe. But then you'll notice there are triangles pointing in toward the cross which pictures the desire of the church to open their arms and welcome people in to a welcoming community of faith where people are loved well. But then notice also there are roads that go out from the cross and that signifies the way the church is called to go out and reach out to other people. Now it's a great picture of the church in that one little image. Keep Christ at the center, draw people in and love them well and then reach back out with the gospel. The problem is reaching out is tricky today because our culture has become so polarized and divided. Many people have negative impressions about Christians, Christianity and they view churches with suspicion and distrust. And they are saying no to Jesus because they think we are saying no to them. It also can be just very intimidating to think, how do I share my faith with 70,000 people at a Colts game? Or at the Indiana State Fair, there are all these people walking around. I'm a Reds fan. You go to Cincinnati right now, they're playing the Cubs. Big weekend, 40,000 people sitting there. And I watch that on TV and I think, how, would I, how could I share my faith with all those people? But it's not just that. It's the few hundred people who yesterday I saw at the Fisher's Farm Market, Farmer's Market. Or maybe it's just the neighbors who live next door to you or in the apartment building near you or the kid whose locker is near yours at school. How do you build bridges with them? How do you find common ground and help your non-Christian neighbors connect to God? Well, that's where Acts 17 comes in. Because it tells what happened when the Apostle Paul visited the city of Athens, Greece. Now, I've been to Athens. And when you go to Athens today, you can still see the remains of great buildings that the Apostle Paul saw there 2,000 years ago. Like the Parthenon. In the first century, this building was there. And it was huge and it was beautiful. It's known all over the world for its architectural beauty. In the first century, about 250,000 people lived in Athens. It was a big city. And it was a center of philosophy and art. It was a birthplace of democracy. And it was known for athletics because the Olympics game, Olympic Games began there. Now, the Bible says in Acts 17 that when people heard Paul talking they invited him to a meeting of the Areopagus. Now, Areopagus is a word that means a place, but it also referred to a group of people who met at that place. The Areopagus is just an outcropping of rock. It's nothing much to look at, but it's this hilly place right here beneath the Acropolis, the big hill where the Parthenon sat, and all these 
fancy Greek temples. And so the Areopagus, sometimes known as Mars Hill, was the place where a group of people, also known as the Areopagus, kind of like a senate, would meet, and they would gather and talk about the business of the city, and they would discuss philosophy. It was a very influential group of some of Athens' most important citizens. So for Paul, the apostle, to be invited to speak to the group that met there at the Areopagus was sort of like getting to invite, invited to address a joint session of Congress in Washington, D.C. We're going to London and getting invited to speak to Parliament. So this scripture in Acts 17 shows us some practical ways to find common ground with our friends and our neighbors. And I want to show you four lessons that we can learn from Paul's outreach model here in Acts 17. Now, the first thing I want to point out is Paul paid attention. He paid attention. Verse 23 says, Paul says, I walked around, he told the Athenians, I walked around and I observed your objects of worship. He walked around. He got out into the community. He visited the synagogue where the Jews gathered, and he went out into the marketplace, the agora, they called it, where the Greeks gathered. In other words, he went to the mall. He didn't just associate with people who already believed in God. He got into conversations with people who would never darken the door of a house of worship, and he connected with them. And we need to do that too. We need to find ways to take Jesus with us into the marketplace, into our everyday world. And when you pay attention to the culture around you, you will see, as Paul did, signs of spiritual curiosity. In verse 22, he began his speech to the people at the Areopagus by saying, I see that in every way you are very religious. Now, Paul used a clever word here. It could be translated either religious or superstitious. What was religion to the Greeks was superstition to Paul, but he didn't slap them in the face. He didn't begin by just offending them. He complimented them for showing interest in spiritual things. Paul goes on in verse 23 and he says, I even found an altar with this inscription. Here's what it said, to an unknown God. Now, in a way, it's kind of amusing. It's like they built all these big temples and all these altars, but they thought, what if we missed a God? <laughs> what if there's one we missed? Let's make sure we, we do one to the unknown God. That way we've covered everybody. We covered all the bases. But in a way, what they were saying was, oh, there's a God we don't know who's out there. And so Paul brilliantly uses that, and he says, well, actually, you're saying there's a God you don't know about? Actually, I want to tell you about that God. And he goes on to talk to them about the true God. You see, when we pay attention to others around us, we'll see that they have common problems and concerns, and we have a lot in common with people who do not yet know the Lord Jesus. Now, this week, 4317, we're for the people who live in the 317 area code. And we find when we get out there among them that there are a lot of things we have in common, concerns about litter and crime and safety and how should we bring up our kids and how do we have better health and how can we make our community better and how can we take care of our aging parents and grandparents. And we have common cultural interests, movies, ball games, music, art, hobbies. We have common questions and longings. How should I handle my money? Who can I trust? What career should I pursue? What will happen to me when I die? We need to pay attention to these things. This 4317 week is a chance to see our community through fresh eyes, to rub shoulders with our neighbors, to make new friends as we pick up trash and clean up the neighborhood. Paul paid attention and he felt emotion. Verse 16 says that Paul was greatly distressed by what he saw in Athens. The word here literally meant to needle or poke or jab, like somebody poking you with a sharp object. The same word is used in Hebrews 10.24, which says spur one another on toward love and good deeds. So it meant to, to be poked, prodded in your heart. What Paul saw in Athens, what he saw going on in the culture, hurt him. It made his heart ache. He saw people who were hungry for God, but were missing out. He didn't want to impose ideas on them. He wanted them to experience the joy and the blessing of knowing God. 
He saw that the people were debating their philosophies and they were arguing with each other and they erected statues and they had all these fancy religious temples, but the religion was empty and their souls were empty. And this bothered Paul. The idolatry in Athens bothered Paul so much, it provoked him to do something about it. God stirred his emotions. You know, when I was a young minister just starting out, this is many years ago, a member of the church told me, and this criticism really hurt, a member of the church told me, Dave, your sermons are okay, but you don't show enough heart. And what they were saying was, you're giving us good information, but you're not somehow connecting to our emotions and you're not showing it yourself. Well, that criticism really hurt me for three reasons. Number one, I work hard on my messages. Number two, I realized that the person who said it was right. And number three, the person who said it was my wife. <laughs> she was here in the first service and Candy said, make sure you emphasize this was many years ago. I said, yeah, okay, it was years ago. But I want to tell you, she was right. I realized it was sort of, my faith was still something, I really believed it, but it was something up here, but it hadn't really gotten down into my heart. And, oh, it, it aches, it makes my heart ache to this day to think that there were people who had heard me teach the Bible who didn't really realize how much I cared about this and cared about them. And people don't really care how much you know until they know how much you care. But the danger is that we just become kind of apathetic and we don't show heart to other people around us. People can tell if you really care about them. They can tell if your heart is in what you say. And let me tell you, apathy is a very, very dangerous thing. We are at risk of apathy in our culture right now. We hear so many disturbing news reports literally every day. It becomes easy to just kind of shrug them off. Another mass killing and we feel helpless and almost numb to it. Even in church, we can hear so many sermons Here's so many prayers. We become kind of calloused and overstuffed. Remember like on Thanksgiving when somebody shoves another plate of food in front of you and you've eaten so much you've kind of lost your appetite? May God help us if we grow bored and apathetic with the gospel. I don't know about you, but I find that sometimes sharing my faith with people is the very thing I need to do in order to keep my appetite for God alive and strong. Did you notice, while we're talking about apathy, did you notice what it says in verse 21? It's a very interesting statement here. It describes the culture of Athens. It says, all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. Doesn't that sound like today? There was a lot of information, but the people were bored. Just always looking for the next fad, the next new idea, some new game to play, some new philosophy to catch on. Is your life like that? Is your life mainly just, well, get up, go to work, come home, eat dinner, watch TV, look forward to the weekend so you can party a little and sleep late? You know what? That's boring. It is boring. We live in a generation with lots to do and lots of information, and yet boredom is so commonplace. A friend of mine wrote a book about boredom. I told him that sounds interesting, actually. His, you know what his book is called? Bored again Christians. Bored again Christians. <laughs> He's saying boredom can be a symptom of spiritual emptiness. That's what Paul encountered in Athens. That's what bugged him so much. Is he had a fire in his belly for serving the Lord. And what he saw was a bunch of people who had lots of information and are just looking for the latest thing, but they were spiritually empty. You know what? If you ask Peter and James and John what it was like to follow Jesus... There are many things they would have told you, but they would not have said it was boring. They would never have said that. Peter and Andrew and James and John, they were with Jesus when he debated the Pharisees, when he ministered to the sick, when he confronted corrupt politicians. They went through storms at night with him. They fed hungry crowds with him. His teaching challenged their minds. He was constantly pushing his disciples outside their comfort zone. Following Jesus was anything but boring. And it just makes me so sad to think that some people don't go to church. Ah, the church is boring. No. 
Our generation needs to discover the adventure of following the real Jesus Christ who says, come follow me. We need to pray, God, fill me with compassion and zeal. Keep my heart tender and my passion for Christ burning. Stir my emotions, God. Paul paid attention. He felt emotion. But listen, faith in Christ is more than just emotion. So another thing that Paul did is he used reason. He used reason. Verse 17 says, so he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Greeks. So he started at the synagogue where there were people who at least believed in the true God. They didn't believe Jesus was a Messiah. They didn't know about that, but they believed in the true God. So he started there. Then he went out into the marketplace day by day, and he reasoned with those who happened to be there. He was reasoning with people. I love that that's the way it's described when it talks about sharing your faith. In fact, if you look back at Acts 17, verse 2, in another place, in a place called Thessalonica, it says, as his custom was, Paul went into the synagogue, and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures. In Acts 18, 4, it says, every Sabbath, he reasoned in the synagogue, trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. So that's the way preaching or teaching God's word was described, persuading people reasoning with people, presenting a logical case for your faith. We don't throw our brains out the window when we become Christians. God renews our minds. He strengthens our mind. We make a logical case for what we believe and why we believe it. That's why here at E91 this fall, on Wednesday nights, we're going to be offering classes to help us have a better understanding of our faith. Well, what if you run into people who have good developed minds as well, but they accept different philosophies. They have a different worldview than yours. Well, that's what Paul ran into. According to verse 18, a group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to dispute with him. Some of them said, what is this babbler trying to say? And others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. Now, the Epicureans believed in hedonism, the idea that personal pleasure or happiness is the ultimate goal of life. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you die. You've heard that philosophy before. And Stoics, on the other hand, believed, ah, you should just kind of accept your fate with a stiff upper lip. Don't show any emotion. Don't enjoy your life too much. And don't worry much about things either. You know, a lot of people are trying to get in long in life by following one of those two philosophies. They may not call it Epicureanism or Stoicism. But basically, there are lots of our friends and neighbors who are going through life just seeking to squeeze the most pleasure out of it that they can, and ultimately they'll find that that is a dead-end road. It leads to emptiness. And others are saying, well, life is tough. I'm just going to gut it out and just get through it. I'm not going to enjoy too much. I'm not going to worry too much. Both of those philosophies lead to dead ends, but they are very, very common. And they're the ones calling the Apostle Paul a babbler. Actually, the word there that Luke, who wrote the book of Acts, uses that says that they were calling him a babbler, it literally meant a seed picker. Like a bird that walks around pecking a little here and pecking a little there. And it is said that in the Greek marketplace, they used that word for somebody who would scrounge around in the marketplace picking up some things, maybe like a shoplifter, picking up things that didn't belong to him and taking them. But it also came to be used for a person who would pick up a little bit from one philosophy and another bit from another philosophy, and he picked out his own, kind of made up his own worldview. And this was a very common thing then, and it is still today. But actually notice what Paul says in verse 18, what Paul was preaching about, what he was talking to them about. They wanted to talk about all their philosophies. Notice what it says in verse 18. Paul was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. Now, let's pause there for a moment because this is a very important point. Don't minimize this. Don't overlook this. Jesus is the heart of our message. When Paul got out into the community, he could have debated, oh, there, here's the problems with Stoicism. Here's the problems with Epicureanism. He, he probably did talk to them about those things. But the focus of Paul's message and his life was Jesus. And I want to tell you, the older I get, the more I want that to be the focus of my life too. Jesus and the resurrection, because the resurrection of Jesus is what makes Jesus, it singles him out as so unique and so special, and it shows the reasonableness of our faith. Jesus predicted to his disciples before it happened that he was going to die and that he was going to rise from the dead. And then he pulled it off. 
His resurrection is a fact of history. Over 500 people saw him after he rose from the dead. You say, oh, come on, Dave. This, is, this isn't Easter. This is August. Yeah, you know what? Because Jesus rose from the dead, every Sunday is Easter. In fact, because Jesus rose from the dead, every day is Easter. Jesus is alive. And there is nothing more important than Jesus and the resurrection. It's what the Christian faith is about. It's what I want to focus on. I don't want to argue with people and nitpick about everything about their worldview. I want to keep bringing it back to the center, which is Jesus and the resurrection. And you know what? When you focus on Jesus and the resurrection, it makes a lot of our excuses just kind of seem very insignificant, the side trails that we go on. You say, well, but Dave, I've got questions about the Bible. Well, guess what? So do I. But Jesus rose from the dead. <sighs> you say, but Dave, there are hypocrites in the church. Yeah, I'm glad they're here because <laughs> we want to help them. <laughs> and, and guess what? Christians don't have a corner on the market when it comes to hypocrisy. There's plenty going around. But you know what? Hypocrisy aside... Jesus rose from the dead. We still got to deal with that. A couple weeks ago, maybe you heard this in the news, a popular preacher and author repudiated his faith, left his wife, repudiated it all, just said, I don't believe it anymore. That makes me really sad, but I'll tell you, Jesus rose from the dead. That person has got to deal with that. You say, but Dave, come on. Republicans and Democrats can't agree on anything. Don't you see how our country is being splintered and racial tension is tearing our country apart, yeah. But if Jesus rose from the dead, from the perspective of eternity, we've got power to deal with something that will break down those barriers and those walls like nothing else, and a message to proclaim that people from all different walks of life can receive. If Christ did not rise from the dead, we're of all people most miserable. We're without hope. But Jesus did rise from the dead, and it makes everything different. And I'm sorry if I talk, sound like a broken record on this point, but I'm going to keep talking about this to the day I die. I want to talk like Paul did about Jesus and the resurrection. It's the reasonableness of our faith at its very center. Jesus and the resurrection. Paul paid attention. He felt emotion, and he talked about Jesus and the resurrection with great logic, a compelling reasonableness. And from that basis, then, he made connections with people. He connected with people. Now, in this 4317 week that we're entering, there are many different practical ways that I want to remind you about that we can use to connect with our neighbors. We can connect with them by just doing something practical to help them. We can also connect with people by serving alongside them. And this week, we're going to be out there picking up trash, picking up litter, along with other people who do not come to our church, who may not go to church at all, who may not believe in the God that we believe in, but we can serve alongside them to do a noble thing and build relationships with them. We can connect with people by eating with them, by inviting them to our home, by having coffee with them in a coffee shop, by inviting them this Friday to Food Truck Friday here at the church parking lot, and just spending time having a meal. As Paul did, we can engage in debate with them. As long as your attitude is respectful and you have a gentleness and a kindness about you, you engage in, in serious debate with people. That's a way to connect. You can engage with people and connect with them by praying for them, by caring for their personal needs. But the point is, connect with people. Don't just isolate ourselves and talk to ourselves, to those who are already convinced. Well, maybe you won't be able to preach a sermon like Paul did to the people of Athens but there are ideas in what he shared with the people in Acts 17 that we can work into our conversations and that we certainly should keep in mind as we connect with others. Here's the way Paul began his message. He said, I see you're very religious. I've walked around. I've connected with the objects of worship that you have. I see that you say there's a God you don't know. Let me tell you about that God. Verse 24. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth. So he starts by saying... Here's one of the things that he says, God created us. This is one of the things that we can stress. God created us. Every person you encounter out there is somebody made in the image of God. And I want to point out the courage that Paul showed because he says in verse 24, the God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth. And listen to this. He doesn't live in temples built by hands. 
You realize how much courage it took to say that when you're standing right in the shadow of the Parthenon? The people were so proud of that big temple. He says, oh, that's, that's a beautiful place. The architecture is great, but don't think you can confine God to that. Even as beautiful as that is, God doesn't dwell in temples built by human hands. So he started with the fact of God's creation. God values every person because he created them in his image. And then Paul moved on to a second point. God wants to be close to us. In verses 27 and 28, Paul said, God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. So he builds common ground by quoting some literature that they were familiar with, their own poets. God wants to be close to us. That's why Jesus came. One of the names for Jesus was Emmanuel, God with us. So Paul says, God created us. God wants to be close to us. And then he stresses another point that's unpopular in our culture, but it's true. We are accountable to God. Verse 29, he says, therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by man's design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. Now you say, whoa, repent? That's a tough word for our ears. Well, guess what? It's not a threat as much as it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to turn your life back toward God instead of away from him. It's an opportunity to get your life back on the right track. Repentance is about making a U-turn. You've been going in a way that isn't working, doesn't make any sense. Turn and follow God. That's why Peter on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2.38 told the people when they said, what shall we do? He said, repent. Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ so that your sins will be forgiven and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. We're accountable to God. And that brings us right back to the thought of the wire. We are here not just to plug in for ourselves, but for other people, to help them. To help them have a place to plug in to. I looked a little closer at that plug, and I realized, you know, some old-fashioned plugs just have two prongs, a hot wire and a neutral wire. But to really have a good, strong connection, you need a ground wire. You need that third prong. When you're talking spiritually, every Christian needs that third prong. Every person on earth needs that third prong because that third prong to me is God. God is the one who grounds us. God is the one who protects us. God is the one who saves us. Now, how do people respond to this when you share this gospel with them? At the end of Acts 17, you know what you see? Three responses to the gospel. Sadly, some reject it. Verse 32 simply says, when they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered. And some will do that even now. Some will be curious, though, to hear more. In verse 32, it goes on to say, others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. And I love that because it suggests that there was going to be an ongoing conversation. You'll meet people who will hear your faith and say, I don't get that. I don't believe that. I don't buy it. But you know what? Let's keep talking. They would like to hear more about this subject. I love that when you can take time to build a relationship and answer questions and develop trust. And then some, joyfully, some believe. In verse 34, it says, A few men became followers of Paul and believed. Among them was Dionysius, a member of the Areopagus. When you go to Athens to this day, you go to Athens today, there's a street called Dionysius the Areopagite Street, named after this man who was a member of that Senate, who accepted Christ and believed, and also a woman named Damaris and a number of others. So some people did believe and some will believe you as well. What about you? What will you do with the message of Jesus Christ? By faith, will you plug into the power of the resurrected Christ and then will you help somebody else to connect with him too? Let's pray. Lord, as a church, help us to keep reaching out and never tire of sharing about Jesus and the resurrection. Lord, even this week as a church and we engage in this 4317 effort, help us to pay attention to the people around us. Help us to feel emotion and concern and real heart for them. 
Help us, Lord, to be reasonable and logical and to share our faith in a way that makes sense. And help us, God, to make connections with people who need to know you and your saving grace. This is our prayer in Jesus' name.